Hi guys. Oh, what a hassle. So sorry about that. Um, my live had, icon had disappeared. So I actually had to take my, my um, Facebook app off and then reinstall it. It was a bit of a nightmare. Once I reinstalled it, everything seemed to be working out okay. But I'm half an hour late, so I'm super sorry about that, particularly those of you that had booked in the time. So I'm very sorry. Um, that's tech for you, technology. Sometimes it works. Most times it works, but there are those times where things do go a little bit wrong. So hello, everybody. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Naomi Judge. I'm a naturopath and clinical nutritionist, and I help women connect the dots between their health, happiness, and hormones, because hormones really do influence so many aspects of our life, to just general well-being, to our moods, to how we're feeling, to our sleep, anxiety, weight, appetite, all of that kind of thing. And today I want to talk a little bit about candida. Now, I'm no microbiologist, so some names and descriptions I might get a little bit um, wrong or I might describe things a little bit um, not scientifically accurate. But what I do know about is I know about hormones. I know about the influence candida and hormones have on one another. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today. So again, I am sorry this is a little bit late. Um, and that was due to a technical difficulty. Now, candida is a species of, um, of young fungi yeast that can grow in the body. It's a communal yeast, so it, it lives in our body quite happily. It lives with other bacteria, it lives with other yeasts, it lives with other fungi, and the main one is albicans, candida albicans, but there are so many different types of candida yeasts, lots of different ones that are actually more um, more prevalent, ones that grow at a faster rate, ones that um, make us iron deficient. But in general, candida lives in a happy environment. So it can live in our bodies, it can live with all the other yeasts, and that is perfectly fine. The problem occurs is when our body creates conditions that allow the yeast to turn into a mycelium. And a mycelium has the hyphae, um, which, are the, which are the long kind of um, spores that we see in fungi and in some yeast. So normally it might live like this, in a little circle and a few might live and then we've got some lactobacilli and then we've got some other bacteria, maybe some strep, maybe a little bit E. coli. And we have all these bacteria and yeast living together, um, living in a community and they're all happy. But the problem occurs when our body gets into an environment where, the, where there's a few different things. I will talk about that. I will talk about estrogen, talk about stress, talk about glucose and how all this affects candida. What happens when the candida is given the right environment it's, it turns it turns into mycelium, it gets the spores, these long spores, and these essentially kind of like can go and live and they can penetrate tissue and they start growing in mass. Then what they form is a biofilm layer. That biofilm essentially is protecting the yeast and it's creating this environment for the yeast to thrive and then instead of instead of living in an environment where it can live happily with all the other bacteria and yeast it actually begins to push everything else out and kind of become rule the roost in that specific place so it could be in an organ it could be in tissue it could be on the skin it could be in the fingernail it could be in the gut it could be in the mouth, it could be in the nose, the ears, wherever it might be. Hi Annie, thanks so much for joining and so sorry again I'm late. I had some technical difficulties and I had to uninstall my app on my phone, install it and then it was okay. <laughs> so that's good. Um, hi Dion, sorry again, sorry for being late. Um, so that's essentially what candida is. So it can be, it's fine. It can be fine in small amounts. There's nothing wrong with it in a small amount. It's when our body goes into a place that create, it turns into mycelium and then it just can create havoc. Um, it grows, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one because 
it can grow in aerobic anaerobic situations so it can thrive on oxygen and and typically yeast mycelium fungi they're a little bit like us they live on oxygen and they live on glucose like us and they excrete carbon dioxide um, candida also it makes um, ethanol which is alcohol hence some of the symptoms you might get if you do have candida you know drunk sensitivity to alcohol um, foggy in the head think of what ethanol does in an alcohol form if you have too much wine or you have too much beer think about a hangover and essentially that is what's happening when you're feeding candida as well it's creating that ethanol and then also it creates things like pyruvate as well so if we look at all the symptoms there are so many different types of symptoms that people experience and I do I think everybody thinks they've got candida problems now we do have candida to some extent but I think a lot of people think that they've got excess candida for some reason candida is one of those things that has been everywhere there's lots of books written on it there's lots of studies you hear a lot of people talk about candida so it's easy to kind of think okay these symptoms do sound like I've got a candida infection but um, it's not always true you might not have it just in, just because you experience some of these symptoms it could be due to other things so just be careful with your diagnosis and I would actually try and get diagnosed because as I said before there are lots of different types of candida and they need to be treated differently brain fog fatigue fuzzy low metabolic rate so candida will cause your body temperature to go down and that will cause your thyroid to actually start to suppress function as well so hypothyroid symptoms depression so low moods candida will also drain your body of glutathione which helps to increase serotonin so also if you've got mthfr you will, and you've got lacking in glutathione it will drain your glutathione even more sugar cravings because candida loves glucose it loves loves glucose that's what it wants to eat it wants you to give it glucose this is why where if, if you rely on too much sugar and too much glucose in your diet um, say you have a diet that's high in high in glucose you might feel tired afterwards because the candida is using it as fuel the candida is going okay I'm gonna use that and it's gonna use that as fuel um, you may also get high cortisol you may get joint pain joint pain can be from the byproducts but also if the candida starts to live in your joints you will get joint pain that way um, inflammation low iron low zinc because it's hard to um, absorb them if you do have biofilm layers in the gut essentially you have the biofilm layers a little bit of mucus on top from inflammation and that stops the iron and that stops the zinc from absorbing smelly wind so um, candida will um, when candida feeds when it feeds on fiber when it feeds on sugar sorry it will produce byproducts that may produce wind in the small intestine as well so that's something to look out for UTI so you can get UTIs after sex because um, prostaglandins actually which are created during sex can cause more candida growth also if your partner has candida it can cause a candida to get into the urethra and that can cause UTIs painful sex as well a low libido can infertility um, mouth problems so fillings smelly breath bleeding gums anything going on in your mouth um, sore swollen glands as well what we do know about candida is candida when it creates an environment and it creates that biofilm it actually has preferred bacteria it likes to live with it's love streptococcus it loves strep so normally in a candida infection we'll also see a bacterial infection as well we know what streptococcus causes lots and lots of reoccurrent tonsil infections streptococcus also causes oral cavities so if you feel like you have a healthy diet but you have lots of gum disease or you have lots of fillings or you have lots of holes in your teeth it can actually be due to candida infection and the candida trying to manipulate the bacterial environment around it because it seems to live with streptococci they must be living on each other's byproducts and kind of living in a happy environment that way and able to thrive so you see there are lots and lots of symptoms there lots and lots of symptoms and that's the thing sometimes we have brain fog and we think okay I've got a candida infection um, but you but but that could be something else so normally you would have had a history maybe of antibiotic use so if you've had a history of antibiotic use there is a likelihood you might have issues with um, candida also stress 
echinocinoids, <laughs> getting tongue-tied, um, that are produced um, from lots of stress are higher. That can actually feed the candida growth. So stress, hydrogenated fats can feed the candida growth. Um, bad quality meat as well can feed the candida growth. So that's if you've got, um, if you've had a history of high stress, if you've had a history of antibiotic use, Maybe if you've taken some immune suppressant drugs as well, that can cause it. Um, if you've got MTHFR or COM2, so any methylation issues that are preventing byproducts to being excreted or they're preventing your body to detox itself effectively, that can actually um, cause problems as well. If you've just generally always had a low immune, you've always been getting coughs and colds, you always get sick, you know that if someone around you has got a cough and cold and you get it, if your immune system is depressed and you're more likely to get, um, get that growth of candida or at least your body can't fight off extra growth of candida. So those are a few things to look out for. Also low stomach acid. Low stomach acid which can cause reflux, low stomach acid can cause bloating and burping. Um, if you've got low stomach acid, we know that you've then got less likelihood to kill off the candida in the stomach. We know that candida doesn't really like to live in an acidic stomach. Your stomach should be about pH 2, which is very acidic. Um, if you've got a very alkaline stomach, it will allow the candida to thrive a bit more. So um, if, you, you know, if you're drinking liters of liters of alkaline water a day, that could cause um, the candida to actually get an environment that will um, cause more growth of the candida. So there are a lot of um, different ways. So you, you wouldn't just get candida, say, for the sake of just getting candida. There would need to be something that was long-standing that was leading up to it. You know, long-standing bad diet, high in sugar, long-standing high estrogen, long-standing immune compromised issues. Those kind of things that go for a long time that would give the candida the opportunity to create that biofilm and essentially become resistant to antifungals. Now that could be another thing. Maybe you you were getting just thrush. Maybe you were just getting thrush. You were getting recurrent thrush once a month from having um, when you're ovulating. So estrogen was high and you're getting recurrent thrush. Every time you had thrush, you took an antifungal tablet and say you had done that for six months. That may give the body a chance to actually then create this um, drug resistant candida. So taking antifungals long term without doing anything else can also cause drug resistance candida. Why the candida is, um, is creating the biofilm is to protect it. So if you're just taking um, Nilstat or something like that to get rid of say a toe fungal infection, the candida in your body will start to get clever and it will start to create those biofilms. So you do need to be aware of that and you do need to be careful of that as well. Interesting, Dion, apple cider vinegar, they have done clinical trials and they have done studies of vinegar externally. So they've done a, um, a, a specific study on dentures and when dentures had the candida and they were put in the vinegar, the vinegar did actually kill off the candida. The issue with apple cider vinegar, particularly unrefined, is it does have the mother, which is a yeast. So um, <laughs> it's a catch-22. Normally a little bit of vinegar is actually better than no vinegar. Now, if you had a severe candida infection, a real severe candida infection, and you were to do apple cider vinegar and you felt funny afterwards, you felt lightheaded, you felt bloated, you didn't feel right, what that is telling us is it is telling us that your Candida infection is so severe that the yeast is actually causing issues in your body, so don't do it. But if you're trying to prevent a candida infection, if you're trying to support your digestion, if you've just got a little bit of candida and you do the apple cider vinegar, it can be beneficial. So there is a difference, there's, there's, there's preventing, there's minor and there's severe. In a very severe candida infection, you wouldn't do um, you wouldn't do probiotics, you wouldn't do um, uh, fermented vegetables, but to prevent candida, you would do those things. So it said the prevention, yes, you would use apple cider vinegar. Severe infection, probably not. I hope that helps, I hope that helps. Um, you would look at it just a little bit differently. Um, so, <coughs> 
So if you have an issue with yeast, and the yeast issue is very interesting, and I'll give you a couple of examples that I've experienced personally, because it will give you a good idea. Um, apple cider vinegar really suits me. It, apple cider vinegar, when I take apple cider vinegar, I actually find it brightens my skin up, but I don't remember all the time. Um, but when I do do it daily, I find it works. But here's the thing. Whenever you do, whenever I've done B vitamins that are made from brewer's yeast, I wouldn't recommend natural brewer's yeast B vitamins unless you have no problem with yeast. The B vitamins in the brewer's yeast um, can cause an exacerbation with yeast in your gut. Here's what I get Dion. I get actual um, rough skin on my forehead um, if I've had any yeast in my diet, too much yeast in my diet. Um, also with um, um, savory yeast flakes as well. Too much makes me tired and stuffs my nasal um, passages up. So you know you've got an issue with yeast, you know if you, lots of sinus problems, itchy ears and real foggy and fatigue. I once went a little bit OTD, OTT with coconut kefir. So it was one of those really strong bottles of coconut kefir. I think you were just meant to have a tablespoon every day. And I remember going a little bit excited and I took a big glug, glug, glug of it. And I just remember afterwards, oh, feeling so fatigued, tired, tired. So again, that's another, that's another example of um, being sensitive to yeast or actually having too much of something that's reacting with the yeast in your body. Um, so um, we talked about low stomach acid. So anything, oral contraception pills, <coughs> um, HRT, anything that's playing around with your hormones as well can also cause um, growth of candida. So let's talk about this for a while. Candida and estrogen have a really interesting relationship. And studies have shown that candida itself can, um, can can um, speed up the growth of candida, um, speed up the growth of candida. The feeder can the candida can kind of feed on the um, estrogen, and we know that candida loves estrogen environments. You know, in the vagina, it loves to grow that. When when estrogen goes higher, when we say have our period, um, sorry, when we ovulate, or say when we um, take oral contraceptive pills. Candida loves that. But also on the flip side as well, or on the other side, studies have shown that yeast, and this is also SB flora, so Saccharomyces. So this is why you need to be careful with Saccharomyces long term. You can take it short term for maybe some minor thrush, but if you take Saccharomyces too much, what studies are showing is that Candida and yeast convert estrone which is a form of estrogen into higher estriol, est, um, estradiol, sorry, estradiol. And so it can create estrogen dominant environments. So yeast has been shown to boost your estrogen levels and create estrogen dominant environments at the same time feeding one another. And what candida does do as well is it mimics estrogen dominance. So you might not have estrogen dominance, but you may have a candida infection, sore painful breasts, endometriosis, heavy painful periods, acne, that kind of thing. And it could be a candida infection. So it's, 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 it's important for us to differentiate the difference between estrogen with a candida infection and just the candida infection on its own and just figure that out. That can be done through testing and that can be done through tracking your menstrual cycle, that kind of thing. So that is important. Um, we also know that estradiol um, changes our immune system. So when we are estrogen dominant, our immune system changes. Now in pregnancy, the immune system changes as well. So we know in pregnancy that a lot of women with autoimmune conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, they actually get, a, um, they get um, an improvement in their symptoms. And this is because um, estradiol turns off Th17, which is an immune response. So Th17 with high estradiol gets turned off. And what that causes, so when we've got high estradiol, this part of our immune system gets that gets turned off, we have less T helper cells. And that allows bacteria and fungi, back other infections to enter our body and our body doesn't have the ability 
to, um, to combat these viruses and these candidas and these bacterias because our T cells have been turned off. So does that make sense? So say in the vagina, if we've got high concentration of estradiol in the vagina, the T cells down there will be turned off, then the candida can thrive. If the T cells were high, they would fight the bacteria. So that gives us a good indication that immune response and our immune system is one of the most important things at fighting yeast and candida. We kind of forget about the immune system, but it is very, very important. Um, this is where I talked about, I put on my Facebook page about kombucha. So kombucha um, has a yeast in it, which actually lowers this immune response as well. So candida plus a kombucha is not a good mix, not a good mix at all, because it lowers that T helper cell response. But um, what, it, what it does show is kombucha might be, good, might be helpful in autoimmune conditions because it actually um, raises that um, TH that T helper response and that can actually help with autoimmune conditions. So that's, that's what can be happening there. So this is why our immune system can actually fluctuate through our cycle. And a lot of you might experience say when your estrogen rises, your estradiol rises, you might get a mini cold or flu for the day. You might get severe fungal infections. You, dandruff might flare up. You might get lots of smelly flatulence because of the candida in your gut. Um, sinus problems for a day or just all, all shaky your immune system gets depressed so, oh you're cold and shaky for a day and you just think I'm on the verge of getting the flu I'm on the verge of getting the flu but it's your estradiol that's high you might be ovulating your T helper cells get depressed and that allows any bacteria, any viruses um, yeast or fungi that are laying dormant in your body to then thrive so just just know that about your cycle and know that that is going on as well so that's the connection with estradiol we've got the connection that they feed one another we've got the connection that estradiol lowers your immune system to allow yeast fungi bacteria, and viruses to thrive for however long it might be um, and we know that um, yeasts actually synthesize more estrogens in your body to create a more friendly estrogen environment for the yeast itself to grow so that is that question i mean that's that with the estrogen and if you've got any questions about that i would be happy to because <laughs> it's a little bit com complex and, and there's a lot to think about there but if you've got any questions about that particular relationship i'm happy to go into that a little bit more where i can a question i did get was about um, candida and insulin what what's going on there why do we get candida and insulin resistance and the simple thing is because in insulin resistant insulin resistant equals more glucose okay candida feeds on glucose and I'm going to tell you a couple of um, really interesting here things here so one is um, that candida feeds on glucose but two is interesting is interesting so candida manipulates manipulates what's going on in your body so it can survive. Candida loves oxygen, candida loves no oxygen, it can live in a lot of different um, environments. And um, what can essentially happen? Oh, thanks Dion, so you get itchy when you have anything with yeast, always in the same spot, and I had fungal toenail for over 10 years. I have tried every toenail infection medication on the market, yeah, it's, oh, it's hard, it's hard. Um, my toenail began to get better when after doing the breakthrough program. So that gives you um, that gives you an indication, Dion, that diet um, does have a lot to do with it. But they're really tricky. And like I've said, the biofilm layers, um, Dion, like on the that they would create this protective mechanism. So diet will take us so far, but then we've also got to try and get in, and we've got to break down the biofilm, and we've got to break down the candida, and and then change the whole aspect. So I'll give you some tips, a little little few tips in a minute of, of anything that you can do to take it further. Now, what's interesting about candida, and what's interesting about insulin and glucose, is that when if you were to go on a no sugar diet, no sugar at all, but you had some fruit and you had lots of protein, say, Candida is tricky and what candida will do is it will um, it will um, encourage your body to do what's called gluconeogenesis. So that is making glucose from proteins. 
it needs fructose to do that as well. So if you were having fruit in your diet in a high protein diet, the candida will use the fructose to make glucose from the protein and it will eat feed on that. That's why some people with a high, high protein diet plus fruit in their diet don't do so well. If it's a severe candida infection, you actually, that's why you have to take the fruit out um, as unfortunately because the candida will get tricky and it will find any which way it can to eat. Um, another question I got, so that's the question on glucose. Does that make sense? The reason we get candida when we're insulin resistant, when there's diabetes, is because there's more glucose flooding the system. Candida loves glucose. That's its primary fuel source. That's what it lives on. So whenever we're having glucose, if we've got candida, we're literally just feeding, we're just feeding the candida. That's when we've got a severe infection. So that's kind of that relationship there. Um, and then another question I got was about surrounding stress. Why is it that stress um, causes more candida? And that's because um, candida feeds on cortisol metabolites um, and also candida feeds on, sorry, my brain was getting a bit, candida feeds on prostaglandins, which can also result from high stress as well. So prostaglandins are an unfriendly, inflammatory factor in your body. We get high prostaglandins when we're eating high hydrogenated fats, um, uh, sugars, when we get stressed. The best thing to help with prostaglandins is actually fish oil, omega-3, it helps to reduce prostaglandins. Some women who get very painful periods, they've got excess prostaglandins as well. Stress can cause those to go higher and that can cause more candida growth. But another thing with stress is when we get stressed, we are getting more glucose flooding our system. When, when adrenaline and when cortisol rise, what our body is going to do is it's going to get the glycogen in our body, bring it into the blood, turn it into glucose for fuel. But what it does is it turns it into glucose for fuel for candida a lot of the time. So just be aware of that stress. And a lot of the times I see clients who have candida infections with super, super high cortisol. So again, it's probably a similar thing. I don't know this as much. I do need to do more research into this part of it. It's probably a similar thing as with estrogen. It's probably that candida is feeding, is creating more cortisol. Cortisol is feeding candida and they've got this mutual relationship of more and more and more and more and more. The same with estrogen, mutual, 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 mutual until they both grow. So that's the issue there. That's a connection with stress as well. So there are a few different kinds of connections there, but definitely with stress. So candida and estrogen, they form good relationships. Candida and stress, again, the same. And then other things that will cause more growth. We've got prostaglandins, low immune issues, MTHFR, oral contraceptive pill, um, low stomach acid, MTHFR, um, anything that's depressing your immune system. So any sort of immune depressant drugs, that kind of thing, that will also cause candida to flourish as well. Gosh, there's a lot there. Um, I did have a couple of questions and um, let me just see if I can go through these now. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so Alex asked, I suffered with horrible thrush through both of my pregnancies. <clears throat> Even while taking SB probiotics, following a candida diet and using coconut oil topically, it was horrible. She's asking what natural remedies actually work. So let me just go through this. So if it was through both pregnancies, we know then it was kind of like an estrogen dominant candida. Now the problem with SB probiotics, what did I mention earlier? Saccharomyces in particular can cause more estrogen dominance. So SB probiotics and saccharomyces should never be used in a severe candida infection. They should only be used in a minor flare up. You use them for a few days to get rid of that um, thrush. So sometimes a thrush infection, you take SB for a few days, it can rebalance because what SB is, is it's a type of yeast called Saccharomyces. And what it's essentially doing is it's balancing out the bad, itchy candida to the Saccharomyces. But you go too much of the SB flora and what's happening is then you're now getting dominant in another kind of yeast, which will cause symptoms as well. So what you probably needed to do was just not take those and actually do a couple of different things to help with the elevated estrogen in your body um, at the time. 
The coconut oil topically, so coconut oil has lauric acid in. Lauric acid has been shown to help with fungal infections. The evidence is not super, super, super strong. The evidence is actually stronger that lauric acid helps more with strep and staph bacterial infections. That's good to know. So you probably needed to make sure that you were using a therapeutic lauric acid, a lauric acid capsule. You could have inserted into the vagina. The lauric acid would have gone topically there because not all coconut oil is created equal with the, with the right amount of lauric acid. So definitely putting something in topical um, in the vagina. So to rebalance the acid, um, a probiotic, a different kind of probiotic would have been better for you. And then taking a little bit of antimicrobials as well. So I can go into that a little bit more when we talk about the immune system as well. Um, Claire asked about the link between insulin resistance and candida, and I think I answered that. It's because of the glucose. <coughs> okay. We've got a couple of other questions here. Is how do Nadine, how do I test for candida? Candida is best test for. You can test to know the candida infection and to know what kind of candida, you need to do a specific stool test because that what will that will tell you is which candida is it, then I know what I need to do. Another test is actually doing the antibody test in your bloods to see if you to see if that's high. So those are the two tests. The spit test. That might tell us we've got candida in our mouth. It doesn't tell us what's happening through the body and through the digestive system. So I'm not a spit test fan. Um, how long does it take to treat? Really depends on the severity, okay? But you're looking at anything from, you know, six weeks to two years. Six weeks to two years, depending on the severity and the, and the reason you've got the candida. Um, okay. And also, is there a link between stress and candida? So I answered that, yes, there is a link. So stress will feed candida and vice versa. So when treating candida, you just gotta remember a few things. One is diet, okay? So we know one of the biggest things in our diet that strengthens the biofilm is, um, uh, oh, <laughs> is, um, beta glucan sorry my mind went a little bit blank then beta glucan that's in your grains that's in your oats this actually strengthens the biofilm this is why those foods actually can cause more tooth decay because they're strengthening the biofilm in your teeth so you really need with your diet you've got to be cutting out those foods we know cause the bio biofilm so we've got to cut out the foods that cause more candida and we've got to cut out the foods that feed the candida. So the biofilm versus the candida. Remember the biofilm is a protective layer which allows the candida to grow and do what it needs to do with all its kind of like hyphae and everything. So we want to cut out food. So food is fructose, food is glucose, food is starch, food is grain. So it's strict, it's strict, yeah? It's, it is strict, but this is if you've got a severe severe infection. So you've cut out all those sugars, that's for a severe infection. So you can still um, add in, um, you know, vegetables, you can still add in your proteins, and you can still add in your good fats, your omega-3s, your raw um, olive oil, your raw coconut oil, those kind of foods as well. And you do wanna have good quality meat. We don't wanna have ones that have got lots of prostaglandins in because that can exacerbate growth. So that's something, to, the first place to go is diet. Diet's gonna help you control the candida. Diet's gonna start to get you there. Now, for some people, diet will be enough for minor infections. But then you need, might need to go that little bit further depending on how severe your infection is. So the immune system is the first place you will look at. You wanna boost your immune system. You wanna get those T helper cells up so high that they're killing that candida and they're controlling it and putting it into a place that it needs to go. And we know the main things involved with helping to get your immune system up. Zinc is a big one. Zinc is definitely a big one. So, you know, taking zinc daily, vitamin C, those two things can really help. So you can do sort of intensive vitamin C every month. You know, five days are very high. Don't take vitamin C every single day. Just do a high dose, you know, every month for five days. You could be doing 8,000 milligrams for four to five days once a month to boost your immune system. And definitely zinc. 
um, to get those T helper cells up and selenium is very, very important as well. So I would just take some kind of immune complex. You could take herbs like andrographis and we know echinacea also gets the T helper cells up as well. So a nice immune complex, you could do that with the diet for a little while and just see how that feels. Does that get you to where you need to get? Does that get your immune system high that it starts to fight the yeast and the candida and you notice that is enough? If you flares up once a month, you might find that once a month you just need to do your intense vitamin C and that's enough to keep the candida away. Next is you want to support the liver. If you're supporting the liver with, um, with blue pleurium, you're supporting it with globe artichoke, you're supporting it with milk thistle, that's going to help your body to remove and clear debris. And that's what it is. It's just remove and clear debris, get it out through the bowel, remove it and clear it, and also support the gallbladder. So we know supporting the gallbladder, apple cider vinegar, lemon in water can really help. Plus globe artichoke is very good for the gallbladder as well. So once you're kind of doing all of those, you just need to reassess where you are. How severe have your symptoms? Have they improved? The, the, you, when you look at symptoms, you want symptoms to get um, better. You want there to be less flare-ups. And when you do get a flare-up, you wanna see a decrease in the rate in flare-ups. So for instance, if you get a severe thrush infection once a month and it's really, really bad and it lasts three days, what you wanna look at, you want that to start dragging out. Maybe it's once every two months. Maybe it clears up after one day. So that's what you kind of want to notice. If the candida's <coughs> making you feel so exhausted every single day, you want to start to feel your energy coming back. So you've worked on your diet, you've boosted your immune system, and you've worked on your liver and gallbladder. Next is you want to start breaking down those biofilms. You want to, you want to be breaking down those biofilms if you've got a severe infection. And that's one of the hardest things to do. So there's a few studies out there. You know, the studies are done... Um, in vitro, you know, they're done in Petri dishes. Uh, it's really difficult to get, you know, human studies, but we've got to take what we've got. We've got to take the studies. We've got to try and implement them into the human body and get it to do what it needs to do. So that's what we're doing here. We're literally looking at clinical trials. We're looking at what works in the Petri dish. We're trying to replicate it in a human. Other things as well, other factors, other influences will, will, will be taken into account. And it doesn't always work off the off the bat, depending on what else is going on in your life, stress, estrogen, all of that kind of thing. So what we do know about the biofilm, the biofilm can get broken down by one beautiful thing, and that's ATP, which is like our energy source. ATP is made in the mitochondria. When we've got candida, what do we know? We know that we get chronic fatigue, we know we get very, very fatigued, our metabolic system slows down. ATP gives us energy. So ATP is made from a number of different things. It's made from magnesium orotate, it's made from coenzyme Q10, um, creatine and B B12. And so you could take like an energy supplement to see if you can just boost or even just take 150 to 300 milligrams of CoQ10 a day um, to get your ATP up. Also intense in interval exercise, sprint running, that kind of thing, that will increase your ATP as well. So, you know, doing that first is a big step. We know that ATP does break down the biofilm layers. Um, then we wanna look at di enzymes. So protease enzymes that will actually help to break down the bio layer. It's kind of fungi, it's, 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 like, it's like it's a vegetable kind of layer on top. So the enzymes that break down very fibrous vegetables, they should help to also break down the bio layer, the um, bio layer as well. And thirdly, I didn't wanna forget this, um, N-acetylcysteine, which not only helps to raise the glutathione, but N-acetylcysteine has been shown to break down the bio, biofilm layer as well. Those are the three main things I would, I've would i used in the evidence, in, this, in the studies that I've looked at. They help to break down the biofilm layer. Then you wanna get in there and just start, just start kind of killing off all that excess candida, the mycelium, the spores, all of that thing that's going on in there. So um, topically, um, for those of you that might have topical infections, so vinegar and also tea tree oil. So don't forget to dilute your tea tree oil. That has been shown to work really well topically. So if you've got a fungal or something like that, you could do the apple cider vinegar, you could do the um, tea tree, as well as working on all the other aspects that I've already talked about, the immune system, the diet, supporting the liver. 
and breaking down the biofilm layer. Um, then we've got, um, so things that work really well, oregano oil, garlic, nigella seed oil has been shown to work very well, um, and ginger as well. So doing a herbal mix with some of those ingredients in, um, the trick when you're trying to get the candida, the trick candida, the trick is to alternate because candida is intelligent. And if you're giving it oregano oil every single day, it will start to manipulate that and it will start to become resistant to that. So you kind of can look at doing three days on, four days off, three days on, four days off, you know, three drops of oregano oil and water for three days, take a break, maybe do some garlic, um, and then um, do something like you could do some ginger. So um, herbal remedies. So you know, sort of the, can you see behind me those herbal remedies? The, the, those herbal remedies, you could get those in ginger, maybe nigella seed and also have an uh, immune tonic and that would be good. So you could get something like echinacea, andrographis, nigella seed, um, ginger, um, um, and maybe some, yeah, that kind of mix. Yeah, that kind of mix. And then also take something like oregano oil on other days and, and alternate that. So that would be a nice thing to do, kind of alternating, plus working on those biofilm layers. Um, I just wanted to see if I've missed anything important out. Um, yeah, so the candida, I forgot. Yeah, it kind of binds to the estrogens. So this means Candida kind of binding to the estrogens might or will also cause the estrogen to exert different effects in the body. I did forget to talk about that. Um, um, okay, I think I've covered everything. Um, and then with bacteria, probi probiotics, I wanted to just touch on this, the bacteria, the probiotics. So lactobacilli has been shown to retard the growth of candida but um, it won't solve it once you've got a candida infection, severe candida infection. What it will do is it will, pre it will prevent you getting a candida infection. So um, take it as a preventative measure, but if you've got candida it's not, and you take lots of lactobacilli, it's not going to um, cure the infection. So there's, we either wanna prevent a candida infection or we wanna actually reverse a candida infection, and it will have to re prevent but not reverse. Oh, hi, Sarif. So um, you missed the diet. So what do we need to stay away from? So there's two aspects in diet, Sarif. Um, one is um, staying away from what feeds candida. And one is um, staying away from what makes the biofilm layer. So what feeds candida? Oh, I've just broken the board there. What feeds candida? Glucose. So sugar, refined carbs, starchy foods. What feeds candida? Fructose fruit okay and it feeds candida in a roundabout way what fructose does is um fructose um, um is in with pyruvate and malate it actually makes glucose so that's why and the candida will know you're having fructose and it will get that fructose to convert through gluconeogenesis into glucose and then it will eat that yum 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 so sugar um, anything it feeds on, sugar, starch, all of those for a, for a um, serious candida infection. If it's minor, you won't need to be a serious, that, that's for real serious infections. Lucy, um, in a serious candida infection, you want to stay away from all fermented foods. However, to prevent a candida infection, you can eat fermented foods. So it's about understanding how severe your infection is. If you're waking up every day, you're flawed, you're so tired and you know it's a candida infection, you've got a white tongue, you've got white discharge, you've got itchy or you've got eczema and you're just so fatigued every single day and you feel so depressed and down and, and you've, been, you've been tested positive for candida through a stool test, that's not the time to do fermented veggies, but you can prevent doing fermented veggies. Um, sugars and then staying away from beta glucan which actually helps to build the biofilm layer um oats are very high unfortunately 
um, and all your grains also have that in so just staying away from that as well so you're kind of looking at um, either you're looking at you know a vegetarian diet with your vegetables or you're looking at some kind of paleo diet very low starch very low sugar um, to help your body recover from this um, fats are okay in both vegetarian paleo style diet that you're doing um, low fermented foods no fermented foods for the time where you're actually treating yourself if it's a severe infection mushrooms have been shown to be okay now um, in studies there's a couple of different things that go on with mushrooms one is they actually stimulate the immune system but I wouldn't do a high amount of mushroom um, but if you have some mushrooms that is okay it hasn't been shown that mushrooms will um, exacerbate and will promote the growth of the candida so i hope that helps so those are the foods to stay away from your sugars your starches your refined carbs that feed it your glucose that feeds it and then your grains and your oats which can actually promote the biofilm layer those are the main foods um, and then also anything with yeast in which can exacerbate and which can um, cause more growth so fermented veggies um, yeasty foods like sauces with lots of yeast in um, and then also be careful with yeast probiotics like Saccharomyces boulardii, SB flora which can get minor candida under control but severe candida long term it can flare it up so just be aware of that. So working on the diet, boosting your immune system, supporting your liver and gallbladder, then working on the biofilm, then taking some antimicrobials. You're looking at anything from just doing a six week protocol if you just feel you want to reset and cleanse. If you feel like you want to reset and cleanse and you feel like you've got a little bit of candida, you're not too sure, you haven't tested, why don't I try this for six weeks just to get it under control? Up to two years for very severe candida infections that have been long standing and chronic and there are more uh, issues at play such as estrogen such as immune system um, prostaglandins that kind of thing so it's really a person by person and how you want to look at it so I hope that helped I hope that answered all your questions um, I suspect there will be a lot more questions on it because it is a bit of a tricky subject and one that I know a lot of people feel it affects them um, and are not quite sure so um, just if you've got any more questions just pop them below so i would just do um lucy with probiotics um you just want to do plain pro probiotics so lactobacilli has been shown to help against candida rhamnosis and plantarum have all been shown to help against um candida i would just get a really simple probiotic to be honest um I that that's that would be my advice I tend to stay away from the super duper millions of strains and just go for ones that have a few strains that you that you understand what they do just lactobacilli acidophilus rhamnosis plantarum and, and just stick with that and you know there, there are lots of brands out there we've got um, inner health plus biocuticals metagenics um, um, all of those I'm, I'm trying to think but my brain's gone blank after talking for so long um, so the, but just just stick to a nice simple probiotics thank you for all your questions thank you Dion thank you Lucy thanks Annie thanks Sarif um, oops where did that go thanks for all your interaction and your questions I really hope this helped because it is a tricky topic but any more questions just pop them below so um, there we go. I will see you next week. And again, sorry for being late. Bye.